Um, but we also hear a lot about them today because they're threatened by um, different stressors like climate change. So this includes the ocean um, warming ocean temperatures. And this is just an example of um, past uh, marine isotherms. I think this is summer isotherms. So southern tip of Ireland would have been 17 Celsius and projected uh, summer marine isotherms. So the northern tip of Ireland would be 17 degrees uh, Celsius by the end of 2080. And this is happening worldwide in some places more exacerbated than others. And we're also seeing a lot of uh, what we call marine heat waves around the world. And a great example comes from Australia that had a huge heat wave um, 2010, 2012, that the kelp forest never recovered from. Also along the coast of California, where I live now, you have a combination of stressors, which included a marine heat wave, or they called it the blob, that kind of wiped out kelp forests. And also at the same time, a viral infection of a top predator kind of wiped out the sea star populations, which controlled the herbivores in that kelp ecosystem. So now kelps are really being controlled by urchin grazing as well as water temperature. So herbivory is a huge factor for any kind of seaweed um, community, communities that are structured by seaweeds. And we do see with hyperborea that they can be overgrazed in their northern distribution um, in Norway. And you might see this also, um, I believe there's some records of high urchin populations in Scotland as well. We don't really see this in Ireland. We don't have the species um, of urchin that is really kind of grazing everything down. Our urchin populations are healthy, but they're not at levels that might threaten overgrazing for these communities. Now, laminary hyperborea is a really cool species. <clears throat> it's very long lived. So a lot of cows will live over one year. Um, but for instance, sugar kelps only two to three years. Digitata, maybe three to five would be the oldest individual you'd ever see. Hyperborea, I've seen a 15 year old in Ireland um, and there's records of 18 year olds up in their colder distribution um, ranges. So Norway. You can actually age these individuals by kind of cross-sectioning the stipe and they have tree rings quite like a terrestrial plant or terrestrial trees. Um, and uh, essentially, these guys get up to about one to two meters, maybe three if you include the blades. So they do create a nice tall stand underwater that really looks like a nice chaparral kind of forest. Now, what's unique about hyperborea when we think about communities in the North Atlantic is that its reproductive timing actually um, it is during the winter, which doesn't coincide with any of the other kelps. And I'm going to get back to that a little bit later, but it's really important to understanding how it might outcompete other species in the subtitle and its, its life cycle in general. Now, there are projections, I've talked about climate change a little bit. There are projections that say that we might be losing hyperborea in its southern distribution ranges. So that would be along the coast of Portugal. And historically, it should have gone down to the southern tip of Portugal. And there's this lovely model here by Aziz et al. Um, from 2016, 2018, that kind of has past historical distributions down to the southern tip of Portugal and projects future distributions to have their southern limit around um, southern Ireland in the mid UK, so Wales, Scotland region. Um, so those are projections for 2100. Certainly it doesn't do great in warmer temperatures and there's actually some studies showing that the quality of carbon that is uh, carbon compounds that it contributes to food webs actually degrades um, in warmer ocean temperatures. Now we know a little bit about that uh, foundation species, let's say for the kelp forest here, but what we don't really understand is how these systems function. And so I kind of mentioned this IRC project before, what we really set out to do was not create this nice food web diagram like you can see from Central California where we have a huge data sets that date back to the 1950s, maybe a little bit earlier. 
people have really invested a lot of time and energy through different organizations into studying these kelp forests. So we tried to begin that for Ireland um, by creating a small scale monitoring program with the IRC um, and essentially just create a baseline for kelp forest ecology in Ireland, create a monitoring scheme that can be replicated across the country, but also contribute to work um, that is done in worldwide networks. So things like uh, I mentioned, I wrote here Keen, but there was also a program Mar4 Biodiversa. Um, so that was funded through the Biodiversa scheme in the ER, yeah, European Research Council. Um, so create monitoring that can kind of feed directly into that and kind of incorporate Ireland into international projections, but also our international understanding of how kelp ecosystems work. And then lastly, by monitoring, we can better understand the resilience of these habitats. So you continue monitoring, you can actually track change in communities um, rather than just getting point in time measurements and trying to infer change. So the way we did this initially is by creating, uh, picking sites that we could reliably get to throughout the year. This is a picture from Bridges of Ross, which is a real pain <laughs> to get to throughout the year. <laughs> but, you know, we successfully did it. We set up uh, monitoring buoys. So these were subsurface or meant to be subsurface for the most part. And they had data loggers as well as recruitment habitats to monitor the environment as well as the species that might be settling in, in the local kelp forest. So a lot of inverts, fish, and even algae species have broadcast um, dispersal of their propagules or their larvae. And we are hoping to kind of capture what would preferentially settle in kelp forests along these coastlines. We also looked at succession plots. So this is a measure of how communities recover after disturbance. And you'll know that we have a lot of disturbance on the West Coast. Feeding in from the North Atlantic, big storms that come up through the Gulf Stream, hit Iceland and come back down to us, really kind of turn things up and tear out patches of kelp throughout the winter, spring. So we wanted to see how they might kind of bounce back from that um, small scale disturbance. And then we quantified biodiversity throughout seasons across all of our monitoring sites uh, using a transect point uh, method, point count methods. And further looked at biomass of the kelp. So that gives us an idea of standing stock of carbon. And we looked at growth. So we look at how fast uh, individuals can grow. And again, they're, they're the, they have a seasonal kind of cycle. So their blade is lost in the spring and regrown at the same time. And that's also how it gets its name mainly because it casts off the last year's blade during mid spring and kind of washes up along the coastline, April through May. So if you look at growth, I'm just gonna dive right into the data here and very loosely talking about some graphs. So I apologize if it's kind of data heavy, but and if you look at growth, it really is very strong, right? During uh, February through March, you see this huge peak. So this is approximately, I think, uh, half a centimeter to one centimeter linear extension of the blade a day on average. So it's really investing a lot of energy into kind of proliferating its blade. Um, during this time period and then throughout the summer uh, to autumn months, it's kind of at a standstill, right? And it's probably investing its energy in other kind of metabolic processes like preparing for reproduction or maintaining defense against predation. If we look at photosynthesis, so this is the ability of the seaweed itself to capture energy, um, what we find, it, we generally measure is uh, chlorophyll A concentrations as well as accessory pigment concentrations. And these are all part of a uh, photo center and essentially work kind of like an antenna to capture the solar signal. 
and then transfer that excited uh, energy into building carbon. So it's a good proxy for ability to perform photosynthesis <clears throat> and almost similar to um, different measures like oxygen production or um, maybe <coughs> fluorescence. Um, Again, if we think about the growth happening primarily in spring, what we end up seeing is that kelp pigments also peak then. So they're capturing more energy at that time period, transferring it probably to sugars. Um, and then these pigments kind of decrease throughout the year when they're not needed for such high growth rates. Um, next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about biomass. So this, um, biomass can be directly related to the size of individuals and the density of kelp. And the bigger the individual, the, the older it actually is. So what we have here is an estimate of biomass of kelp per meter squared across multiple depths within the kelp forest. So you can see um, that it generally um, is is fairly constant, <laughs> um, but you have a, a, a change in density as well as you get deeper. Sorry, I'm being a little bit waffly about this. Um, but I think what's interesting from this, so you have these, these kind of individuals going from two meters to 12 meters depth. You have this kind of maybe not a significant trend in the change of density um, or the median age or the biomass, but you have um, an interesting uh, correlation between the average age of the kelp and the density. So kind of like in terrestrial trees, uh, forests, you see that as, in, as a forest matures, it actually self thins. So the older plants are shading those younger juveniles and not allowing them to grow to maturity um, as they kind of take up all of that light energy. So it's pretty interesting um, when we talk about, in, the, in a little while, I'm going to get to this idea of macroalgal spore banks. Um, and this may feed directly into that, the self-shading. Now, I talked a little bit about how light was important for building sugars. And so we also um, took our individuals and we looked at uh, carbon or basic sugar concentration. So that includes mannitol and laminarin. And we look at the concentration across season, site, location, and then the age of the kelp. And what we find is that in general, um, there's a seasonal fluctuation in both of these compounds. So laminarin is peaking in winter to spring while mannitol is decreasing then. There is pretty high variation in, across sites. So not so much for bridges of Ross and Cararo, these kind of group together and they group with letter mullen when it comes to laminarin. But this site Nufi, um, which is in Kilki, had kind of a strange um, sugar concentration signal that really made it stand out from all the other sites. So, that's important in the sense that like, okay, there might be some environmental conditions at that site that make the kelp store sugar in a different way, whether they're trying to store um, what it looks like more laminarin throughout the year on average um, and less mannitol. So there's, that's kind of interesting information to kind of build future work on, especially if you're thinking about aquaculture, wild harvest and stuff, which would target compounds like these. We also see that there's a variation in age. So when you look at kelp, and if you know the age of them, you can see that there are pretty significant trends in both the size, the amount of fouling on the individual, so the amount of stuff that's growing on them, um, as well as um, just the general appearance. So once they get very old, like, over seven years old, they start to look pretty ratty. Their blades are pretty tiny and they almost seem to be more of a host for other species than they are a primary producer. While 
from this range, let's say from one to five, they generally have very big blades and look very healthy. Okay, so that's just the kelp itself. That's just basic information on primary productivity. But if we look at the biodiversity of the species that you find in kelp forests, um, it's pretty interesting. So, and um, Sea Search was really integral in doing all of these surveys. Um, we have surveys from kelp forests at the four monitoring sites that we really looked at. Um, but we also have surveys from superlid worm reefs, specifically in Letter Callow and Arden Bear. And that's it. <laughs> Merrill beds um, around Kilkiran Bay. Uh, sediment bottom habitat. So this is an image from Loch Ine, but also around Kilkiran Bay, and then bedrock wall habitats, which would predominantly be within Loch Ine, but I think there's a few sites also within Kilkiran Bay. So we take this data, we look at all these surveys from all these sites, and basically what we're doing is we're looking at the abundance and diversity of the species associated with habitat types, but also across season, um, and, you know, site is important. We do these transects, which basically just count the number of individuals we encounter within a certain swath. And what we find is that kelp forests really stand out from the other habitats in the species that are associated with them. And there was definitely over 300 uh, different species or taxon groups. So for instance, we don't identify the polychaetes for a type of worm to species, unless they're the superla vermicularis. I believe that's a polychaete. Um, but we do call it a polychaete. So that, that would be one of the over 200 species that we kind of place within this, these groupings. Um, so it's quite a few species and it, there's high seasonal fluctuation. And what we see across, so you see the seasons kind of cluster out a bit but the sites actually cluster out more. So each site is unique on its own. When compared to marrow beds, to perlar worm reefs, bedrock, sediment habitats, they're unique, but when you kind of compare them to each other, they also vary. So local environmental conditions, maybe current systems that are delivering larvae to each site are probably affecting the communities that establish themselves there. Now, if you look at what dominates these communities, um, what we find is that you have a lot of echinoderms, so it's the urchins, again, never to levels of overgrazing, uh, your holothuria species, um, cotton spinner, common sea star, although it's unique about kelp forests and something that we were trying to do whenever we taught science diving in, uh, at Galway uh, was a lot of these sea stars inside kelp forests are very small, the common sea star. And we know that if you're diving on a marrow bed or if you're in a superlative worm reef, these guys can get much larger than your hand. Um, but inside kelp forests, they're generally around five centimeters in diameter. So kind of an interesting fact. Uh, lots of spiny sea stars, lots of mollusks. So a lot of the gibula species, which I think has changed um, in the past couple of years, that genus has changed. Uh, we also periodically see a lot of crustaceans and um, so a lot of our sightings are anecdotal because they're so, uh, they're much larger mobile species, um, so they move a lot, but you definitely see seasonal peaks in crustaceans within the kelp forest that I think are very correlated with when people lay their pots in the kelp forest. Lobsters are probably continually present, um, but also again, very common. If we look at the canopy, um, oh no, my baby just woke up. <laughs> if we look at the canopy, what's kind of interesting is that in the summer, you'll see lots of juvenile fish that are approximately one centimeter or less in length. And they're generally hiding in this area, maybe from visual predators during the day. Um, and they definitely go away by late August. So there's some information showing that, okay, that's an interesting behavior for these, I think mostly juvenile gadoids, 
and that could be investigated. So maybe kelp forests are a rookery for a lot of commercial fish species. Again, no one has ever really looked into this, but it would be very interesting. Now, if you look at recruitment, and um, this is actually really tricky to investigate in Ireland, well, on the West Coast, in the regions that we had our monitoring sites, because waves or maybe people take out a lot of these moorings, some of them all the way out, so take the chain as well. Um, and so you end up losing a lot of these habitats that you're trying to collect larvae in and then bring back to the lab. So, I mean, but, but still we have some data that's really interesting. So if we look at the smaller habitat that's meant to collect mostly invertebrates, you see some nice partitioning across season. Generally spring kind of stands out. And in this season, we saw a lot of crustacean larvae um, or juvenile crustaceans kind of in these habitats. Um, and if we look at the bigger ones, we lost more of these more frequently. And these are modeled after the Smurfs that you see on the west coast of California. These are meant to capture pelagic fish recruits. Um, a lot of the species in the North Atlantic don't necessarily have a pelagic stage. However, we captured a ton of larger invertebrate larvae, a few pipefish juveniles, and a lot of seaweeds actually on this. Because we lost a lot of them, we don't really have great seasonal partitioning. And, but uh, we do see a little bit of site-specific variation. You see Letter Mullen kind of here, Bridges of Ross here. Um, enough to say, okay, well, this is a preliminary data set and we can really build off of this and better understand um, how species are working in these habitats. Okay. Uh, lastly, before I grab the baby really quick, um, these kelp are a habitat themselves. So, I mean, that's what's really cool about the species. You see this in the giant kelp here in California. You see this on other species, mostly in the holdfast. So, for instance, the golden kelp or Lamia digitata. There's inverts colonizing those, but you never see it to the level that you find um, on Cuvi or Laminary hyperborea. So, the holdfast here and the stipe are completely covered by the age of two or three. And you can see that species richness and diversity really increases. My mom got him. <laughs> species diversity and, and richness really increases with the size of the individual, which is correlated directly to the age. So the older they get, the better they are, the bigger the home or more of a home they are <laughs> and the more biodiversity they're fostering, which is why it's really important to have um, older stands of kelp forest either within your habitat or at least in adjacent. And if you think about that from a wild harvest perspective if you want communities to reseed themselves. Okay, so sorry, this is this is the stipe and this is the hold fast data. Hold fast data is actually a little bit cleaner if you look at this. Okay, lastly I'm going to talk about succession. <laughs> so we measured this in two different ways, which leads us to the Kelpres project. And I'll speed up a little bit. At native succession, what we did for this is we cleared a one meter square plot of all um, macroscopic organisms. So sponges, kelps, turfs, everything that we could clean up. We didn't burn it and we didn't bleach it. So we didn't kill the substrate, which was generally a car uh, uh, encrusting coral and algae. And so that's why it's pink. Uh, but then we also put out these sterile succession pots, which are just concrete. So these were conditioned so that any kind of harmful substances leached out before we put them in situ. But they were left up for the same amount of time. And what we see is that for the first hundred, after the first hundred days, juvenile kelps generally start growing right away. 
So 100 days seems like a long time, but in terms of the life cycle of this species, it's not that long at all. After a bit, uh, the animation is working again. <laughs> After a bit, they start self thinning. So, and there should be only like four juveniles here and they should be larger. Um, so 200 days, they start thinning the population. Certain individuals get larger. And they, they essentially, these plots became unrecognizable after about 250 days. So it started to look exactly like the adjacent kelp forest really fast. So very quick recovery in the scale of 250 days, two thirds of a year. If we look at the sterile plots, they started to build turf bacterial communities, it seemed after about 40 days. We noticed this because there was sediment building up on it that couldn't really be displaced very easily. So it was stuck in a matrix. Um, after about 115 days, we start seeing colonization of calcified inverts, other sessile invertebrates, so tunicates and sponges. And after 300 and full, almost a full year, after a winter um, recruitment event for kelp, we start seeing the growth of these individuals. So really what this suggests um, is that there is potentially some sort of microscopic bank of stages on these native succession plots that allows kelp forest to recover really quickly. While you, you see it takes a full year for the establishment of this benthic community and then a recruitment event for these kelp forests to start bouncing back in on artificial substrate. So that leads us to the EPA project that Sea Search was integral to. And we were really interested in resilience of these ecosystems. So the ability for them to recover from a disturbance and maintain their normal ecological function. We attempted to find that with our baseline data that I just kind of presented. However, it may vary regionally. So what we really know is we have a baseline for the West Coast and this could be, hopefully will be replicated along the southeast, southwest, and northwest of the country. We know that kelp forests in this region have a lot of stressors. So you have your short-term stressors, marine heat waves, kelp removal, maybe from harvesting, maybe from annual storms. But we also have our long-term stressors like climate change, increased um, intensity and uh, more frequent storms in the subtitle, so potentially taking out far more um, than just a small area of kelp forest, maybe taking out whole sites worth of kelp. And then, you know, proliferation of wild harvest and repeated harvesting of different sites can be a huge stressor for different communities. Again, if we look at this data from Jorge Cis, um, we are projected to be um, or Ireland is projected to be at the southern distribution range by 2100 if ocean warming rates continue as they are. Um, so this is the worst case scenario, which seems somewhat likely given all the different governments and all the different things that are going on in the world. Um, and so being at the southern distribution range just opens you up to um, you have very little wiggle room when you're sessile species with where to go. If it's too warm to the south, you can only go north. And if you're a sessile species with very short dispersal ranges, that's a tricky thing to do. So you have to either adapt or die. So really what we're interested in in Calpres is a few, like the full cycle of things. Where kelp forest has historically been an island Maybe we could see if their distribution, uh, different distributions have shifted over the past 150 years of modern records. And um, what the genetic structure and connectivity of these habitats is in Ireland. And that's very important if you think about things like adaptation, they need to have that genetic raw material for adaptation to occur. Um, and if we have low diversity, especially in some of these regions that might be more prone to warming, um, you know, we could lose these communities completely. Just depends on what we find. Um, and then we wanted to know about the life cycle. Like I mentioned, these species reproduce in winter 
what they do is they um, produce zoospores, which are, actually, I'm going to go through the life cycle in a little bit. <laughs> And um, so is there a resilience in this life cycle? Essentially, it moves from a macroscopic kelp stage that structures forest to a microscopic gametophyte stage, which is responsible for sex. And I will get into that. Um, but both macroscopic and microscopic stages could be nice trade-offs depending on, um, you know, if, if they allow communities to recover from things like storms and stuff better. And then lastly, you really want to factor in how we can continue to monitor these habitats. So if you're here when we're talking about drones and seaweed monitoring, um, maybe this is something we can continue to do so that when we know our present day distribution, we can then track change in, that marine, um, in the marine environment and try and mitigate habitat, habit, mitigate habitat loss. Okay. So I'm going to jump right into some of our results. When we looked at historical distribution of these species, we generally were drawing from either literature from the 1700s to 1800s, um, herbaria, which are virtually non-existent for kelps actually because they're so big. They're really hard to preserve without mold and other things kind of getting in the way. Um, and then kind of anecdotal accounts of the presence. So actually what we found is that, you know, our earliest reliable record for a hyperborea, it wasn't a misnomer. So a lot of people called it digitata or called digitata hyperborea in herbaria and we had to kind of tease that out. Um, this earliest record was actually in Hookhead. So in 1913, that's our earliest reliable. Um, and then as you move on to the 50s, there's a huge gap there and we probably can assume that it's due to world wars. Um, to 1950s through 60s, um, we start seeing more records as we go along the coastline. And generally what sticks out to us is that um, a lot of these records are around areas um, of higher learning. So academic centers. So that would be in Cork and Galway for marine botany. Um, Clare Island is a big one up here. And you get a lot of repeat records actually in this area, these areas as well. When we get to the 90s, um, you have more people using scuba as a tool and you also have um, the Biomar program where they did these habitat records across the coastline of Ireland. And then you have the beginning of Sea Search and Sea Search Ireland from the say late, what do you call that decade, the aughts? the late aughts um, to the, the early 2010 through 18. So, and um, kelp records, you know, obviously are much more abundant to date. We have geo-reference data points now through international data sets. <clears throat> but the thing that we're really lacking with this kind of data collection is we don't really know what state the kelp is in. For a lot of these records, there's no mention of whether it was in the subtitle, intertitle, as drift on the beach, alive, dead. So we don't know what state it is in. We don't know if it's associated with a kelp ecosystem or if it's a one-off record that's just randomly in a seagrass bed. Um, and so we can't in infer anything about kelp forest. We can only say that this is where that one laminary hyperborea was found. So it's a real kind of miss in terms of understanding distribution of these communities. Um, and moving forward, we kind of need to think about that, especially if we're going to, if you want to use citizen science uh, uh, groups like Sea Search Ireland, but also just your local Sabaka club um, to contribute to these kind of data sets. Now, if you look at genetic diversity, uh, a preliminary study really showed us that Ireland has, um, the kelp forests in Ireland have pretty high genetic structure. And what that means is that communities on the Southeast were generally more diverse, sorry, more diverse than communities as you moved up the West Coast to Donegal. So we have um, samples from Cork, Banshee Bay and Loch Ine. We have samples from Clare, both Bridges of Ross and Kilkee. And um, we have samples from Galway, including Newquay, 
Carrero and Naramolin, and then we have a sample from St. John's Point. This is just the preliminary study, mind you. Now there's huge structure across this coastline, much more than what you might see in the uh, southern coast of France, so southern Brittany. And um, they really cluster very tight together, whereas those along the coastline here don't. And that might be intuitive because it's the shorter stretch of coastline. And this is a very rugose, reticulated coastline with a lot of opportunities for genetic isolation. Um, but it's very important if we think about informing harvesting and preserving these communities. Now this kind of collection, especially with sea search, has allowed us to also discover or find the presence of non-native species. So we have a new record for Andaria pinnatifida or wakame in gray stones, as well as a record for laminary ogreluca, which is a golden kelp up in bell mullet. And that's really an opportunity. And I mean, it's, a, it's, it's kind of, it's upsetting that we see these species here because they have a potential to kind of interfere with the natural ecosystems. Um, but if we don't know they're there, we don't know that they're interfering. So it's a great opportunity working with Sea Search to actually kind of discover these or the, find the presence of these species and kind of move forward with monitoring and, and see if they're actually anywhere else in the subtitle. Now, um, I've already kind of gone through the results here. Again, in the Southern coast, we find that actually the greatest diversity in terms of um, we have very high rates of heterozygosity, meaning that there's um, a lot of variation in um, which alleles are found in different individuals. And um, we also see that they're isolated by distance, meaning the further a community is away from another, the more genetically distinct they will be. Um, in the EPA project, we added approximately 40 populations to this, and I'm just going to briefly show you what we found. These, uh, these DAPC plots kind of use a color coding to show you the span of genetic diversity, if you will. Um, and so you can see that the Southeast and Southwest are pretty distinct. They have a large kind of array here and they tend to be the most diverse still. And there's a lot of structure in Ireland still. So all of these different regions from the Northeast around the, to the East, south and then west and northwest are pretty, they're, they're very different from each other. And um, so there'll be more out on that soon. Hopefully we'll publish a paper on that this year. And then I'm gonna get to looking at resilience within these communities. So we're really looking for banks of microscopic kelp stages. And if we think about the life cycle, when, you have this macroscopic stage of the, of the kelp. Uh, the blade undergoes meiosis, which produces um, single chromosome paired zoospores. So if we think about reproduction in ourselves, we're diploid organisms. We have two sets of chromosomes, but our um, reproductive organs produce sperm and egg that are haploid. So they have one set of chromosome. That happens through meiosis. That occurs on the blade of the kelp as well that produces this so haploid stage that then settles, develops into a gametophyte, which can be male or female. They produce sperm and egg that then recombine like our human cells do and produce what we see here, the macroscopic kelp stage that is again, diploid. Now that microscopic stage can be held kind of in limbo in aquaculture very easily. Um, and they generally control that with different light levels and temperatures, depending on the species you're working with. And it is species specific quite often. Um, and so maybe that happens in situ as well. So things like low light levels might be very common in dense canopies of kelp. Um, low temperatures might be very common during the winter and spring, for instance, in Ireland. And those might help arrest development of these stages, allowing them to bank and then be available for canopy clearance events like storms to reseed the community. So we tried, this is actually really tricky to investigate. And um, so we did a three-pronged approach. 
And the first was to use an in-situ in experiment to collect the zoospores, the haploid stages, and potentially allow development of gametophytes on microscope slides. And so we, we put these at two different sites across a range of canopy cover and three different depths, which were not that distinct, generally between three and six meters, and just because the nature of near shore kelp forest. But, um, and then we left half of the slides um, in situ for a season and half of the slides in situ for a full year and monitor environmental data. We also brought pieces of bedrock into aquaria and then allowed kelp individuals to maybe grow out. And that was a somewhat successful. We replicated environmental conditions in this lab experiment. Um, but I'll get to the results in a little bit. And then we use genetic techniques to just kind of bark, what we call barcode, um, what is living in the microscopic community uh, on both the bedrock um, at, these my, at these monitoring sites, but also bedrock across um, different locations in the country. So we kind of, we tied these collections in with our genetics, our population genetic sampling from the Scaries in Dublin all the way around to sites within Donegal. And we collected those during the summer because if, if the seasonal timing of hyperborea indicates that any zoospores and gametophytes produced in a year should start growing out by spring, any microscopic stages that are present during summer collections have to be banked. Because if they haven't grown out in spring and if they don't bank, then that genetic material should theoretically, those zoospores or gametophytes should have passed or senesced and then potentially been digested by the bacterial um, or just the biofilm community itself. So, I'm just going to show you what these guys look like. Again, here's the sporophyte that produces the zoospores, which are haploid, that then develop into the gametophyte that becomes, again, the sporophyte. If we look at zoospores, these guys are modal. So you can sort of see them shaking here. <laughs> There's this kind of after they've settled from the water column onto these microscope slides. And um, you can see they're single cell. They have a little colored eye spot there. And then here we have a picture of a gametophyte developing. Um, it's hard to sex them when they're only two. I think this one's two cells in size, um, but it's definitely settled. The zoospore is settled and it's starting to grow. Now in lab, we did a little settlement experiment to see how many zoospores were produced within laminary hyperborea. And we generally see higher zoospore production during winter. So this is from January, early February. And then remember, this is also a period of high growth rate. So they've invested a lot of energy in zoospore production, and then they're turning on to and they're turning to investing that energy in growth. We see that after approximately let's say 13 days to 20 days, zoospores are generally settled and becoming gametophytes. Um, so it takes about 62 days for the gametophytes to really fully take over that community. See, so we move from unicellular to multicellular. Um, so if we have a release of these guys in January, that indicates probably around March and April, you'll see gametophyte development in situ. And so I'm just going to show you what the experiment looked like in the field. And you can see this is from June 2020, I believe, at one of our sites. And there's actually, these have been in for 10 months at this stage. And there's juvenile kelps growing on these microscope slides for the annual slides, actually. So very cool. We captured recruitment of hyperborea. Um, as well as some other kelps, and they started growing in these experiments. Now, um, what I'm going to show you is actually just some brief results from meta barcoding or barcoding only. And that, you know, when I say barcoding, you're using a, a DNA sequence to kind of scan 
what species is there. Kind of like when you check out the grocery store and you scan your can of juice or your box of milk. So what we find is that across our treatments, we have Darinon and we have Caro. And across seasons, we see different species. And the thing with barcoding is that when you have congeneric or high, uh, sister species, they often will have very similar sequences and they'll all be amplified by the same PCR primers. So we ended up having a lot of mixed kelp sequences that infers we need to move to metabar coding, which we hope to be doing soon. And what's interesting is that in spring, you see a lot of laminar hyperborea, but also the presence of some species that we never see macroscopic individuals of, so wakame, dabberlox. In summer, we had a lot of wakame, we had a lot of jijitata, mixed kelp, and that is interesting because sugar kelp, uh, or weed, I think uh, Dapralox, maybe Saccharides all reproduce in the summer period. So you'd expect to see these guys more prominently from summer to autumn in these microscopic communities. Because again, we're collecting these slides seasonally. They should represent only a season. Autumn, we see predominantly digitata in the subtitle and then winter, laminary hyperborea. So spring and winter are really dominated by laminary hyperborea, which we expect. And when we sequence that annual slide that includes all seasons, huge amounts of mixed kelp. There's some spots where you have a lot of kame as well as digitata, and that really stands out, not mixed kelp, saccharides and polysheetes as well as mixed kelp here. And that might just be because of their proximity to the adult who's releasing the zoospores, um, or just the highly heterogeneous kind of structure in the subtitle. So very, very mixed results, but gives us a lot of seasonal signals. Um, and, you know, really kind of highlights that if we, if we, um, if we see only, you know, one species that's, that, that we're seeing what we expect. I'm getting tongue tied here, sorry. <laughs> In the summer collections around the country, um, we have a lot of sites um, where we have laminary hyperbrea really standing out, which is pretty cool. Um, we have Undaria pinnatifida in two sites. Uh, we have uh, one of them is Scottsport in Belmont, as well as Greystones in Wicklow, where there's a healthy Wakame forest on bedrock. So we expected that, but we have also mostly mixed kelp barcode. So again, the meta barcoding should really help highlight what species are where. And this is kind of a positive indication that, you know, we are seeing banking of multiple types of kelp species in these communities. So very cool. Now, lastly, I'm just going to touch on monitoring tools. Kelpress has this, um, put out this nice dive slate. So mostly it's available online through this. We were giving out um, we had business cards with this bar, uh, what's this called again? QR code on it. Um, but we also have paper versions of the dive slate to bring with you for citizen scientists to kind of go out and just kind of estimate density of different types of kelps, presence of non-natives, so okraluca and wakame, and then density of the different echinoderms um, and mollusks and such that really stand out in kelp forest communities and can be used as an indicator species to, to show us how healthy that ecosystem is and whether or not it's a real, um, like robust kelp forest. Um, and then lastly, we've developed some uh, methodology for sensing kelp forest communities down to 10 meters depth in nearshore habitat. So this is an example of um, uh, QSAT data. So just RGB um, combined with bathymetry data. I think this is LIDAR data from the Marine Institute from Infomar. And really we do this methodology here in the middle. It's kind of like the Goldilocks technique <laughs> uh, where we can really kind of 
we've scuba, we've dove this site multiple times and we can say that this is very accurate kind of margin for the kelp forest down around seven to eight meters. You try and go deeper, you get a lot of backscatter and you get a lot of noise. This out here is not kelp. There might be a deep uh, eelgrass bed around 20 meters or something like that. But generally this is, this is about what we see for kelp forest distribution. So that tool could be used um, in the future to kind of sense kelp forests in the near shore habitat. So yeah, lastly, this is the, this is again the QR code and this is the Google form that that leads you to. Um, if you're interested in contributing, we've had very few people kind of get into it. I think um, it can seem daunting trying to identify species, <laughs> uh, seaweed species, but it's, it's a, I think it's an important tool and hopefully people will become more interested in the future. All right, so um, that's it. Sorry, it was a bit rushed. So <laughs> near the end there, a lot to talk about. And um, uh, luckily I didn't have to bring Ernie to the talk. <laughs> so uh, do you guys have, I'll just hang around for questions if you guys have any. <laughs>